Just ahead on this special holiday edition of American Black Journal, we're going to take a look back at some of our guests on the program from this year. Reverend Jesse Jackson talks about diversity in the auto industry, and Wayne County Prosecutor Kim Worthy updates us on efforts to test thousands of abandoned rape kits. Plus, we'll hear about President Abraham Lincoln's legacy from Doris Kearns Goodwin and get a music replay from this year's Detroit Jazz Festival. We have a packed show ahead, so stay right there. American Black Journal is next. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal. Welcome to American Black Journal, I'm Stephen Henderson. Every week on this program, we bring you interviews that are inspiring, educational, or entertaining. We talk about the topics and issues that matter to our community, and we explore the traditions and achievements of African Americans. Today, we're pleased to replay some of this year's notable conversations. The automotive industry has been around for more than 100 years. You would think that by now, we would not really be talking about opportunities for well, the history, A history of racial discrimination. We worked for a long time on this and the line was real, real hard and dirty work. Uh, we um, uh, consume, we over-index as consumers when it comes to the business of the matter. We got our first we buy lots car of dealership in 1966, yeah. mm -hmm. so over 50 years ago. Uh, and yet there's nothing in the industry that we cannot do. The focus right now is an additional job as auto dealerships and suppliers. Uh, and then there is legal and administrative and, uh, and advertising and markets, a whole range of stuff. Yeah. And so we are really indexed and far beneath our capacity in the industry. And so what we did, uh, Mercedes-Benz, for example, has Mercedes been 360 dealerships, six African-American. We indexed around 25%. Yeah. Uh, v VW, you know, about the same. So it's global because we've had to take delegations uh, led by Mr. John Graves and others to, uh, to Japan to meet with Honda, Tis the Nissan, and Toyota. We have to go to Germany to meet with VW and Mercedes Benz in light of what has happened with VW because the, the violation of the law by, by VW is a big deal to everybody. Sure. It's not just emissions of, of, of soil, uh, of dirt, but it's also omissions of equal opportunity. Right. So we, we're really not looking for <laughs> the diverse, diverse, we're looking for fair trade. We're looking for two way trade. We trade with you. Trade with us. You trade with well, us. I share dealerships and franchises and suppliers. Do you find that there's a difference between the way the Detroit three automakers deal with this and the foreign? Do you have a bigger challenge with the foreign automakers? Well, they're coming up fast now. Toyota has it specifically, but General Motors is taking the lead in so many areas. When Leon Sullivan was on the board some years ago, they led the drive for affirmative action. GM led uh, the drive to get. Um, uh, us out of South Africa still yes. on condition that, that made sense. And so there's a sensitivity to GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Ford and Chrysler is no longer American-owned, but there's a legacy of, of, of history there. And it comes in part out of UAW as well, right. out of worker sensitivity. But, but we must not, because these companies are not producing so much, but they're going south. They're not coming back to Detroit. They're going, VW is in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right. Toyota's in Plano, Texas, and in Mississippi. Uh, VW is going to South Carolina. They're going to basic right to work law states. And so as they come under those conditions, we have to reassess how we relate to, to the growing industry. Because once the civil rights barriers came down and bridges were built, then these industries began to go south. And with that comes a whole new economic agenda. It's different. It's different. It's still different for African Americans. Opportunity is still different. Well, it's particularly beyond, beyond the working on, on the basic assembly line, and those are good jobs, by the way. But beyond that, we have the right to be dealers, and, and in proportion to our investment, sure. dealers and franchises. And when there's a, then even high tech has become such a big deal. You can't drive these cars now without not having a great sense of technology. And we spent a lot of time this year tying in Silicon Valley and the automotive industry. Yeah. And that's the most insensitive industry going. You would think, since it's so relative, Silicon Valley. Since it's so relative to new, it would yeah. be much better, but it's not. 189 board members, uh, 36 uh, white women board members, uh, three blacks and, Is that right? and one Latino. Uh, in the C-suites, 360, three blacks, one Latino. 
Wow. Board members, Apple has zero, Facebook, zero. Uh, that's changing now because HP now put on four black board members last uh, week. Uh, and Apple now has put on Jim Bell on, on their board. So we're fighting to get board position in C-suites, but also to get STEM education to our children, to get yeah. for young boys and young girls. Uh, we have a tech center at Rainbow Push in Chicago. We want a thousand churches. The little that we use some of that empty, unused Sunday school space. We can teach children the apps, codes, and financial literacy and financial and marketing. And, and that's where it starts. I mean, they, they have got to be up on those things to, just to compete for any job. Which they, they can do, by, by the because we don't have a talent deficit. Right. It's, it's an opportunity deficit. There's nothing we cannot do. I think of, every time I think about the automotive industry, the, the, the most sensitive job in the whole industry, the designer, the chief designer in the world is Ed Welpern. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> in the whole world, every GM, he sits at a desk every day and looks at six continents, and he, and he has to pass on every design. He grew up in, in the South, you know, went to Howard University, okay. learned his art, his form, and, but we don't see that, that, that face of the other industry. Okay. Uh, women are running manufacturing plants, and we're trying to get them to expose what we can do because we can be president of the United States, we can be president of all the companies. Right. right. <laughs> Talk to me, though, about what that means, the, the, the testing of these kits. I'm not sure uh, people really understand uh, what's involved here and then how you get from testing it to saying, well, here are the people that we need to, to start looking at. Well, the reason why women, and not just women are raped, but I'm going to use women because they're overwhelmingly women, go and have a sexual assault kit examination, which is a four to ten hour, very intimate yes. exploring of their entire bodies to get some kind of forensic evidence, saliva, hair, fibers, anything to help get a genetic profile and try to, to help the perpetrator be caught. When, when the forensic scientists are done with their profiles. And so then to learn that they're sitting on the, on the shelves for, for years and years and years is disheartening. So we want it, we, we've gotten most of them tested, but again... And we, testing them means uh, taking the evidence that's in the kit and matching it against... It take, the the, the uh, scientists will take whatever evidence is in the kit and try to, and hopefully you have enough genetic material to make a, a profile okay. that can then be loaded and entered into CODIS. And CODIS, C-O-D-I-S, is the DNA National Database. Right. And so, so if we, I'm a if I'm a criminal uh, in Kansas, for instance, uh, there is a genetic profile of me in that in that database. And if I had committed a rape in in Detroit at some point, uh, yeah. it would. If it would there show is up. a profile of you in there, and we put a profile then that matches, it can match to you. But there are two different kinds of hits. It either matches to a known person, or it matches another case. For example, okay. if a a woman was raped and the nightgown was taken and put into evidence, and the forensic scientist pulled a profile from that nightgown and put it into CODIS, it could possibly hit to a piece of evidence in another case, but I we don't see. know who the person is. Okay, okay. And and how, mon how many of the uh, of the kits are you getting those kind of multiple hits? Well, uh, we have, um, we so far, and again, the testing, more and more testing is coming in every day, and we have 288 identified serial rapists, so yeah. people who are in the system more than once. And then, like I said before, we have uh, 11,000, I mean, 1,133 um, CODIS hits yeah. that we are to work with. Right. Uh, and so that next step is saying, all right, well, let's go find these right. people and, and bring them to justice. Let's take each individual hit, work up a case the way it should have been worked up when it first happened. So you have to still go find the victim, you have to find the defendant, you have to find the witnesses, any other evidence besides just the DNA evidence, yeah. and put the case together the old-fashioned way. Yeah. And so, right, we discovered these kits in 2009. We've done a lot of work since then. Most of them are tested now. But now we have another kind of backup or backlog in my office where we have over 600 cases right now where we have DNA hits that have to be investigated. To have a, they're waiting to have an investigator assigned. Yeah, yeah. And that, that gets to uh, all the problems that you have with uh, resources. And exactly. You just don't have enough people. Exactly. Uh, to up, do until, it. up until a couple months ago, we had two. And contrast that with the city of Cleveland, who discovered about 4,000 kits several years ago. They had 35 investigators, yeah. I think 25 to 35 right. investigators, wow. to our two, to two. That we had. Right. Now we have seven because we have five that have been embedded in, from the Detroit Police Department at no cost to us. And then we're getting ready to hire more because we have funds that are being raised and coming in. Right. And, and the, the, the time 
that these investigators need to spend with these kids. I mean, we're not talking about weeks or months. In some case, cases, these are this is going to be years before you can. Sometimes clear they all will. This up. You know, if you we we made a decision early on to to assign a f five, six, seven cases to one investigator because we want to make sure that we they're investigated thoroughly. And so sometimes we can find the victim in the first phone call. Sometimes it takes months to find the victim. Yeah. Sometimes it takes a long time to find the defendant. And sometimes we get lucky and everything's done fairly quickly. And so you never know when you pick up that CODIS hit file what you're going to and how much time is involved. It's very, very investigative heavy. Yeah. Very much so. Right. And since we're, we, they're all going to be embedded in my office, they're working side to side, side by side with the prosecutor. So search warrants and whatever we need can be quickly be gotten. And it, it's great for the investigators because they know exactly what prosecutors need to have a successful case in court. When we were growing up, when I was growing up, I didn't have a doubt that there wouldn't be support structures in place to get me where I was going. Uh -huh. uh, today I, I run into too many children that are actually hopeless. Uh, they're not dreaming like we were able to dream. Uh, and their, you know, their prospects are limited because they're disengaged. Right. And so uh, you know, what I want uh, to do is to really uh, be a part of a child-focused effort in Detroit moving forward. Okay. From education to health to family and economic security of families. So that list that you read, it sounds long, but it all works together. But it all works together. Absolutely. Uh, so if I'm looking at the work that the Kellogg Foundation is doing in Detroit uh, right now, give me some examples of, of ways okay. in which you're fulfilling that mission. One of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm most proud about is one of our grantees, the Detroit Parent Network. Uh -huh. You hear a lot about how families need to be engaged. And the foundation has an entire family engagement strategy. And we're very much focused on how parents are understanding what's happening in their community and owning the advocacy of how to move communities forward. Right, right. And, and for viewers who are not uh, familiar, the Detroit Parent Network is a group of parents who Absolutely. are uh, trying to uh, disseminate information and set an agenda for uh, improving educational choice and opportunity in the city. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And so you guys are, are helping to fund that. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and we also, you know, you may hear of many investments we've made in education in Detroit. Sure. And you'll know that that's both in the Detroit public school system and in very successful charters. Uh, what we want is systems that work. Right. And, and we've been very uh, intentional about finding those that are really developing children toward success. And, and where do you feel like we stand with that? And the, just in terms of the investments that, that you guys are making, I mean, most parents in Detroit, I think, are frustrated yes. by the, the current state of the public schools, right. the lack of choice yes. other than those schools. Uh, where are you seeing your investments uh, start to pay off? First of all, we have a lot of work to do yeah. in this area. <laughs> right, sure. uh, and, and where we believe we can be most successful is in the very early ages of children. Okay. So we've been uh, looking very much in the, even before kindergarten, right. those zero to age eight that time frame. Those, those years, those, those and really pre development years. And really prenatal, sure. working with the mothers and the families. Uh, but we believe that, and research shows that investments there really pay off uh, for children. And we want to make sure that, you know, as we move forward, that we give children the best start. Looking at those preschool programs, the Head Start programs we have, we've invested significantly in the collaborative for the Head Start uh, grantees here in right, the state, uh, right. in Detroit. In Detroit, yeah. yeah. Up next, we'll continue our look back at the past year on American Black Journal. We'll bring you interviews that focused on history, on medicine, and on music. But first, here's a look at some important moments in Detroit's black history. I'm Ken Coleman with a look back at African American life in Detroit. This week in 1951, Duke Ellington headlined the Cotillion Club's annual fashion charity ball at the Greystone Ballroom. In 1964, the Detroit branch NAACP urged the Michigan Civil Rights Commission to study police brutality against blacks. And in 1987, the Scene Dance Show ended its popular run on WGPR TV 62. These are significant events this week in Detroit's black history, taken from the book On This Day, African American Life in Detroit. 
Black history, career opportunities, and the arts are topics we talk about all the time here on American Black Journal. This year we had guests who brought us interesting information on the Detroit Jazz Festival, Blacks in the Field of Medicine, and President Abraham Lincoln's fight to end slavery. Of course, his presidency is baptized in cannon fire, uh, immediately plunged into the, into the Civil War, and a series of very tough decisions about how to, to, to guide the country through that, but also uh, how to end slavery, which becomes, of course, the central, the central theme of his, of his presidency. Uh, in 1863, he signs the Emancipation Cl Proclamation, which is very controversial at the time, not just because it's about slavery, but also because it's an enormous exercise of executive exactly power. So. That's something that uh, it seems like we have been struggling with uh, since the Constitution was written. Where is that line between what the president can do and what he has to wait on, sometimes a very reluctant Congress to help him with? You are absolutely right. I mean, even at the beginning, while he would have wished to deal with slavery when he first entered the war, he knew that he didn't have the power as president because slavery was protected by the Constitution, saying that property was protected in the sure. South. So he just at the beginning went for keeping the Union together. That was his message in the inauguration. It's what he did the first couple of years, even though people were saying, you have to do something about slavery. Yeah. It was only when he finally realized that as commander-in-chief, he had extraordinary powers that he wouldn't have simply as president and the African Americans were being used by the Confederates in building trenches, in cooking, in helping the cause. So he knew that he could argue that war necessity allowed him to take this huge step right. of an executive order for an Emancipation Proclamation. But it was what he would have liked to have done even earlier had he come to a position in the war where he knew it could be legitimized. Right. Uh, in, the, in the book and in the movie, uh, there's such a warm, personal portrait of, of this president. Uh, and and I, I thought you did such a wonderful job of showing how these decisions sort of visited on him personally. They were not easy. And he, he sat with them a long time and often went back to them and thought, boy, was that the right thing to do? That, again, is something that I think uh, we see all the time with, with presidents. Yeah, I know sometimes when you know that it all turned out all right, you know, that the Union won yeah. and slavery was ended and the war was a victorious one, um, you forget that he often said that if he had ever imagined the tension he would live under from the time he won the election until they made the decision to rearm Fort Sumter or send the food down, right. he wouldn't have thought he could have lived through it, that looking back on it later, it was awful. And I think that's what makes him so accessible to us is that he was vulnerable. He did have his sadnesses. Yeah. He had his great sense of humor. I mean, when, when I was working on the movie with Tony Kushner, what mattered to me more even than whatever story they chose to illustrate him was what kind of character is he going to come across as. And I thought Daniel Day-Lewis just perfectly portrayed the Lincoln that I knew, even to the point of walking like Lincoln walked, like uh -huh. a laborer coming home at the end of a hard day, and, and telling those funny stories. Yes. I kept teasing them, you have to put humor in, because that was a big part of the way he whistled off sadness, as right. he said, through his funny stories. Yeah. And they did it. And that's that. I, when I first saw the, the clip of the movie, actually the first group cut of it at Steven Spielberg's house, I came away thinking I wasn't even watching a movie. I was watching Lincoln. You were watching walking, him on talking. Screen, It was so right. exciting. Wow. I was surprised to, to see these numbers. Uh, when you think about the progress that, uh, that has been made with regard to African Americans in higher education sure. since 1978, sure. uh, you would think that, that medical school and, and medical school for African American males would be uh, the same story as, as for, for, for other uh, fields and, and, and people, obviously it's not. Tell me, tell me why that's true. Well, you know, I think, Stephen, there's a number of factors. Um, you know, I've been in healthcare since 1989, and um, I've, I've been around Texas, California, and, and now Michigan, and it's not surprising to me to see, to see the data. And I think you have to think about a number of things going on in our society that contribute to it. I mean, I think first and foremost that um, African Americans, particularly in large urban settings, still have gaps in terms of educational access. Sure. Um, when you think about career um, access and career, uh, career opportunities, oftentimes you think about um, people doing things um, when they see others like them doing it. Mm -hmm. 
um, and you don't see a, a greater preponderance of African-American male, particularly uh, physicians. Um, and when you look at higher education in general, what you see, particularly in terms of African-Americans, you see more African-American females matriculating to college than males. Than males, sure. And so when you think through those kinds of, of, <clears throat> of uh, demographic factors, um, I think that's, that's leading to, to some of the issues that, that we're seeing in that report. That right, right. And so what, is the, what are some of the things that, that you've got to do to, to try to reverse that? I mean, it, that's a long trend, 1978 till sure. now. Sure. Uh, what, are we, what are we missing? Well, I think that one of the things that, that many folks are focusing very heavily on are pipeline programs. Um, and there are a number of pipeline programs that exist across the country. And pipeline programs are generally intended to target individuals who would likely have interest and aptitude, but who may be unaware of that career as an opportunity for them because there's no one in their family, there's sure. no one in their community who has pursued it. And so pipeline programs can begin as early as middle school, mm -hmm. um, high school, um, and college. And frankly, as, as a student, would progress in their educational career, the pipeline program becomes more sophisticated. In the middle, middle school ranks, it's really focused on opening up that opportunity for you and saying, you know, there are people like you that can do this career, you can do this career, um, no matter what your circumstances might be, right. there are opportunities for you. Let's begin talking to you about what are the preparatory steps necessary. In high school, then, you begin to help, help them understand, well, what's it take to to get into college and to be able to, to be successful in the kinds of academic studies that, sure. that would lead to medical school. And then beyond that, you begin really pairing individuals with professionals and helping them understand, you know, what are, what, what, what's the trail, the trail that I've blazed and so how do, you, how do you do what I've done? One of my favorite things about the festival is that it really just sort of takes over the Central Business mm -hmm. District yes. uh, yeah. for the, those days uh, in, in September. That's got to feel, that feels different now than it did five or ten years ago because of what's going on in Detroit. This sort of dovetails with uh, the, the, whatever you want to call it, the rebirth, the, the, the new energy that we have downtown, and the, the city just shines for those days. Mm. Well, well, five years ago, we set out to raise the profile of the festival, and in doing that, we found some great partnerships like Quick and Long, who has actually does our opening night as far as giving a major contribution to that. And so yeah. it's really stuffed it's up. On, it's on their front porch too, yeah, <laughs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so, you know, building our profile and getting those more major partnerships to highlight our integration with the city and being up what we're in, in campus marshes and helping the city come alive. I mean, you know, that definitely, you know, shows that is really about the city. Right. That is about the people. It's about that integration. And and from that, I mean, you know, like I said, with Sharon's help and what Chris does um, with the performance piece, you know, we continue to bring on more partners, bring on more individual donors yeah. and supporters who, who are helping us keep it free. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about other jazz festivals around the world, uh, how many others are free the way this one is? I mean, no, uh, nothing to this level. Yeah, and and you know, in, in addition to it being free, though, there is like so many things out of Detroit in Detroit's history and, and the current city, the Detroit Jazz Festival is is something of of a singularity in the jazz festival world. Not only is it focused on the art of jazz and the central development of that art form and the respect to the legacy, looking forward to new artists, et cetera, we're also uh, very much involved every year in commissioning new works, creating large works, small works that have impact around the world. So in addition to things like uh, uh, Pat Metheny is premiering his uh, piece called Homage, it's the North American premiere, it's for strings, it's for big band, it's for media, it's all closing the festival on Monday night with a bunch of soloists. The idea is that it's something new that no one's ever heard before. Danilo Perez is premiering a commission that uh, we, we asked him to write called the Detroit World Suite. And it brings together professional musicians from Panama with musicians and university musicians from the Detroit area to create this, not only a performance at the Detroit Jazz Festival, but something that's going to travel to Panama and yeah. premiere there in January. The idea being that Detroit Jazz Festival has something that at any ticket price, you wouldn't be able to see anywhere else. Yeah. And I think in that way, we can be really proud of the fact that we're doing something that, that no one else That is doing. no one else is doing.
We hope you enjoyed today's program. Thanks for watching. All of us here at American Black Journal wish you a very happy new year. You can always go to AmericanBlackJournal.org to check out past episodes and connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time. At DTE Energy, we believe that we have a greater responsibility. We believe that being part of a community means being involved in the fabric of that community, investing time, effort, and resources in the communities we serve. DTE Energy Foundation is a proud sponsor of American Black Journal.